Good morning, church family. What a joyous day this is. The sanctuary is all dressed in its finest for Advent. How about you? How about you? Are your hearts dressed in their finest as we prepare for the coming of Christ later this this month? Jesus was born into a world that was dark and shabby and, and gray and sad, but now that Christ is here, We dress in our finest and we celebrate that God is with us, Emmanuel. And that's our theme this morning, Emmanuel. Whether you are in a pew 
or in your living room or in a care center or in a hospital room, I'm glad that you're with us this morning. Make sure that you're being friendly with your name tag. Uh, please fill out the connect card that's either in your bulletin or on your screen. That helps me out a lot. If you're online today, this would be a good time to put your prayer concerns on the, in the comments. It would also be a good time to, to run and grab some, some juice and some bread or crackers in order to participate in communion with us this morning. Whether you're a member or not, whether you're here or not, whether you have a church or not, you're welcome to participate in communion with us this morning. Advent and Christmas are all about incarnation. Incarnation is a big word that we use, and, and one of the definitions that's around is the doctrine of the incarnation holds that Jesus, the preexistent divine logos word, and the second hypostasis of the Trinity was conceived in the womb of the Mary of Mary Theotokos, God bearer, so that Jesus Christ is fully God, fully human. His two natures joined in hypostatic union. What? Right? We can make the incarnation really complicated. Okay? Because it's it's beyond our understanding really but we can make it sound really complicated but we really don't need those big words we really don't need to make it all that complicated we really don't need to make it hard to understand because when it comes right down to it the incarnation is Emmanuel God with us let's look for God with us this morning as we prepare for worship as we listen to the prelude Join with me in the call to worship. <clears throat> in the beginning, God created all we can see and all we cannot. And God made us. We are made in the image of God. No one has ever met a God like this who works for those who wait and do what is right. But we've sinned and kept at it so long. We deserve your anger. Like at creation, we long for God to rip open the heavens, come down, and make us anew. We bow before you, asking for grace and mercy. Rejoice, children. 
Our God is ready to remold and reshape us. We enter this holy place confident that God can restore our identity. Please join now in singing, O come all ye faithful. Would you be seated? Piper and her family are going to come up and share the Advent wreath with us. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, at, and at Advent, we light candles to remind ourselves of the light of hope and promise of peace he brought to the world ravaged by sin. What is peace? Peace is the end of hostility and fighting. It's when all is as it should be. It's harmony, it's righteous, and wholeness. These candles represent hope and peace. When Jesus came, he brought peace between God and humanity. For us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of peace, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it 
with justice and righteousness from the time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census would be taken of the Roman em- entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Cornelius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own own town to register, so Joseph went up, up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary. He was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest, there was no guest room available for them. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our God, thank you for sending Jesus to make everything right between us. We're grateful for the peace that comes through knowing him. Help us to be champions of your peace. May we be peacemakers in a world torn by sin and strife. Help us to be yours as we wait for you to come again. We love you. Amen. Thank you, Jason. Aubrey Piper. Would you stand and pass the peace of Christ to one another, saying the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. And while we're doing that, the children up to fourth grade can be dismissed to Sunday school. Did anybody else notice that the bells on the screen were synchronized with the bells that were being played? You you guys probably didn't look up long enough to notice that, but your tempo was almost exactly the same as the bells on the screen. It was really kind of cool. I'd like to say we planned it that way, but to be honest, no. (laughs) What joys or concerns do you have today that you'd like to lift up in prayer? Yes, Barb. Okay, girls' dance team came in fourth in a big competition in Des Moines, so we want to give thanks for that. And they wore uh, the cancer uh, ribbon, the pink, and they all wore a silver ray, which is the color of ray cancer. Okay. Okay. You know, the, the ribbon for, for breast cancer that's, that's pink, they had one like that, it sounds like, that was gray or silver, uh, which is the color for brain cancer uh, in memory of Amy so, and others who are suffering with, with glioblastoma and other terrible brain cancers. So we want to, uh, we, that's a, what a wonderful witness that was. Jazz? Pardon me? Riley Noggle. Okay, very good. Thank you. So, very good. Uh, Riley Noggle won a, won a scholarship as part of that competition. So, lots of great things happen in that. Walt. Glad you're out again and got the brace off your, off your leg that you're able to be with us this morning. Yes, Bob. I think we need to get a blanket for baby Jesus. 
Bob's very concerned about baby Jesus laying outside without any clothes on. So if anybody has an extra blanket, it would be a good thing to go cover him up maybe. Or get some straw or something, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, it was pretty tough that first Christmas. We want to continue to lift up Jewel and her family as they grieve. Uh, we want to lift up um, Sandy as she continues to heal. Anyone else? Okay. When we lift up the family of Mark Reesberg, uh, who, was, who was found dead this week after being missing for a month or so, um, you know, what a dip, difficult time that was for the family and, and now their time of grief. We also want to lift up the Schultz family uh, as uh, we still search for, for David. Uh, what a mystery that is, and we lift up him, him and his family in prayer. If there's nothing else at this time, would you allow me to lead you in the pastoral prayer? Holy God, Mary said, here I am, your servant. Oh, that we could say the same with such faith. Here we are, Lord, in this place surrounded by your angels high above us, surrounded by human angels in our midst. Here we are, Lord, surrounded by so much more outside these doors, the busyness of the world, the political world, the crowds of people, the hurrying everywhere. Here we are, Lord, in a world that is in deep need. Nations are at war. Leaders are making immoral deals. Interest groups are watching out for themselves. And so we pray again for the leaders of our world that they will become justice-seeking people, caring for the welfare of all who inhabit their countries. We pray for justice for the poor, and for the marginalized. We pray that work would be available not only to the highly educated, but also to day laborers and for everyone in between. And Lord, we pray for ourselves and all who are within the sound of our voice. We know that you have a special place in your heart for families, especially families with young children. We pray that they will have anticipation in their hearts in this season and peace in their homes. We pray that our older members would find moments to share their wisdom and experience, that teens would know that they are loved and accepted, that each of us would be reminded of your wonder once again, that relationships where they are strained, O oh Lord, would find compassion. And Lord, where hearts are grieving, we ask for your comfort particularly in the Klein family and the Reesberg family and other families who are grieving at this time. And for bodies broken, waiting for diagnosis and surgery and recovery, we pray for healing, oh God. We pray for comfort, we pray for peace, we pray for wisdom among the caregivers. Come, Lord Jesus, help us to say again, here we are. Here we are, your servants. We pray this in the name of the one for whom we wait, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning, our offering is an offering not just to the church, but to God's kingdom, to the work that God does among us. And we offer not just our money, but we offer our hearts, our lives, all that we are, so that God's work may be done among us. Would the ushers come forward to receive the morning offering?
Here we are, Lord. Here we are, and you are among us. And we give you thanks for your presence and your power. And this offering is yet a symbol of our love for you. Let our hearts overflow. Let our love overflow so that all that you need to do among us will be done. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you be seated? Our scripture this morning is from John, first chapter, uh, verses 1 through 5 and 9 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. And he was the world, and the world came into being through him. Yet the world did not know him. And he came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. During Advent, we keep talking about the word incarnation. What in the world is incarnation? Well, that's exactly the right question to ask because it is when God came into the world in the flesh in Jesus Christ. Without the incarnation, Jesus is just another rabbi among many. Without the incarnation, the crucifixion is just another story of imperial power run amok. Without the incarnation, the resurrection is just an odd mystery. The incarnation is central to our faith, but let's be honest, it's a very odd doctrine. I was thinking about the story, the angels, the shepherds, the mother, the stable, the star, the baby, and I, and I began to chuckle just a little bit because it's such an unlikely, strange-sounding story. And frankly, it's kind of a wacky plan that God had in doing this. But it is God's plan. And, and the incarnation, we can dress it up to make it sound really philosophical and, and really intellectual, like that definition I read at the beginning of the service, but that doesn't really help us to dress it up in big words, does it? Here's the bottom line. God created people to love and be loved, but sin kept getting in the way. God tried, but people sinned. God tried again, but people rejected God's attempts. God tried again, and the people said, oh, I get it this time. I can do this. But it wasn't long before they slid back into sin. So God sent a prophet, a prophet named Isaiah, who said, wait, not wait until your father gets home, but wait until my son gets there. He said, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. So we be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Peace, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In other words, just wait until my son gets there. The point is that the incarnation, in the incarnation, God came to earth. Emmanuel, God with us. It's evidence of God's existence, God's power, God's love, God's grace, God's vision. The incarnation of God in Jesus Christ is the pivotal point in all human history. Gathering up all of our hurts and creating a future of hope. 
Just because the incarnation is simple is central to our faith does not mean it's simple, however. Doesn't mean it's easy to understand. So today, today I want to try and bring this, this complex theological concept of incarnation to life for us. So I want you to imagine with me. I want you to imagine with me a conversation which God the Father explains incarnation to Jesus the Son. Now, this is an entirely imaginary conversation, okay? You won't find this in the Bible anywhere, but it's based on the passages that are in the Bible. And you'll, find, you'll see those come up behind my head or on the screen over there. Uh, so you see the passages that I'm referring to as I, as I walk through this imaginary conversation this morning. Imagine with me, if you will, God the Father approaching Jesus and saying, your mission if you choose to accept it, and of course you will because you are me and I am you, your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to leave heaven where you've lived since before time and to shed your robe of divinity in order to take on skin. You'll become human. And when you do this, everything will change. Our relationship with creation and people will never be the same again. And I can imagine Jesus stopping dead in his tracks and his mouth just falling open because this is a radical plan. The very idea that God would become human, that the creator would become part of the creation, that the earthly kingdom of sin would be visited by the heavenly kingdom of glory is frankly nothing short of amazing, astonishing, shocking. Even more amazing is that this was not plan B, as some have taught. No, this was the plan for the very beginning of time. From before there was anything else, it was God's plan that God would become one of us and live among us. After Jesus picked his jaw up off the ground, God started again. I have arranged with this really nice young lady, and she will be your mother. She'll have the honor of being the mother of God. Her name is Mary. And, and she is as trusting, as faithful as can be. She's one of the few human beings who would be willing to say, let it be for me as you have said. Now, she won't understand at first, but she'll figure it out. She will be remembered as Theotokos, the mother of God. Mary will love you, and you will love her, but it will be kind of cramped for about nine months, and then she will push you out into the cold, bright world. And Jesus stopped it right there and said, now wait a minute. Whoa. Couldn't we just use a stork for this? Now remember, this is all imaginary, right? And God says, no, that won't work because you have to experience the fullness of humanity. You must experience being born. You must experience growing up. You must obey your mother when she tells you to eat your broccoli. You must find out what it feels like to be bullied. You must find out what it feels like to be weak and small. You must experience betrayal. You must experience what it means to grow up with a stepdad. You must experience what it means to live in an occupied territory subject to the whims of governments and powers over which you have no control. You must experience powerlessness and fear and what it's like to have a soldier demand that you carry his heavy load. And I, may, I can imagine Jesus stopping God again and, and saying something like, but I know what that's like. I am, after all, God. You know, omniscience and all that stuff. But God said, to know is one thing. But you can't experience it as a human being experiences it until you become human. You will be 100% God but you will also be completely 100% human. Don't try to do the math, God said, because on earth, the math of the Trinity or the Triunity doesn't work. That math only works in heaven. If you ask your math teacher on earth how 100% and 100% can make 100%, he'll just think that you're being mouthy and you'll experience something else that human beings experience called detention. Remember, you'll not, you'll not be part human and part God. You'll be completely human and completely God in every way. No tricks, no illusions, no doubt, but even your best friends will not understand. Being 100% human, you'll experience pain and sickness, troubles and trials, hurts and temptations. Every human being experiences these things 
and you will too. But you will not in any way come close to sin. You'll want to turn those stones into bread, but don't do it. You'll want to prove who you are by doing something stupid like jumping off the wall of the temple, but don't do it. You'll want to take a shortcut and just take over the world, but don't do it. In my imaginary conversation, Jesus says, of course, I understand, but I would never, and God interrupts him and says, you don't know. You don't know what you'll do until you experience the irresistible power of sin and temptation seeping into every crack of your human body. But you will not sin. You can do all of that because you will not inherit the sinful nature that seems to drag people willingly or unwillingly into the darkness of sin. You'll have to fight that with everything you have because the entire army of evil will come to destroy you. They will hate you. They will make every effort to stop your mission. They will do everything they can to end what we're trying to do. But it won't work because you are God. Jesus nodded but didn't interrupt this time. God continued, he said, I, I know it will be weird. You'll be so tempted to turn that broccoli into a lovely chocolate cake, but don't do it. You'll be tempted when Mary makes you come in from playing to take a bath. You'll be tempted to part the waters and sit defiantly on the bottom of a dry bathtub, but don't do it because <laughs> it's not about you. When it comes time and you get the chance, though, to turn water into wine, go ahead and do that. And Jesus said, well, why would we do that? And God said, because it'll mess with the uptight Methodists and Baptists. <laughs> I think they both got a laugh out of that one. And then God gets serious again. He says, I'm not going to send you to New York City or Rome. I'm not sending you to the uptight folks who look down their nose at you. I'm sending you to a little out-of-the-way place called Israel because your mission is to the weak and the forgotten oh yes you'll encounter the rich and powerful people but they'll have a harder time hearing your message she said no while you're on earth focus on the average person pay attention to the children uh, pay special attention to the sick the handicapped the rejected Pay special attention to the hard-working poor, the teenage moms like Mary. And speaking of leaders, you will be brought before the leaders, and they'll mostly be worried about keeping the power that they already have and getting more power. Like Herod the Great, he will kill a lot of children trying to get to you to take your life. But your parents will take you to Egypt for safekeeping. You'll get to learn firsthand what it means to be a political refugee. You'll experience firsthand the fear that drives people from their homes to, do, to take ridiculous risks just to seek safety in a foreign land so their children will not have to live in fear. But unlike many of them, you will return to your home from which you came. God continued, when you can heal someone, do it. When you can forgive someone, do it. When you can love the unlovable, do it. When you can bring hope to the hopeless, do it. When you can reach out to the forgotten, do it. Because that's why you're there. That's why you'll be putting on human skin. Because we will go to any length. Nothing can stop us from loving our children. Yes? That includes Herod and Caiaphas, but it also includes the paralytic, the boy with five loaves and two fish, and those two sisters whose only means of financial security suddenly died, Mary and Martha. Jesus, just make their lives better. And when you encounter one of those whose sins are as big as a neon sign flashing above their heads, sinner, 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 hopeless, 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 forgive them. 
When you, when you encounter Judas, whose sins are as big as a neon sign flashing over his head, betrayer, 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 and he sells you out to the soldiers in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus interjected, I'll forgive him. And God said, that's right. When you encounter Peter, your closest friend in the entire world, who will reject you, you'll forgive him. And he'll reject you again, and you'll forgive him again. And he'll deny even knowing you. But even though his sins are as big as a neon sign flashing over the top of his head, denier, 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 you will forgive him. And when you're hanging broken on the cross, when the crowd is watching you being beaten and abused, when they're watching you being broken and dying, when, you see, when they see a completely innocent man being destroyed at the hands of an earthly power, love them. Love them with all the power of heaven. And if it's hard, if it's hard and it will be, just look up to me and say, Father, help me forgive them. And I will, because they don't know what they're doing. God continued, the physical pain will be overwhelming, but the spiritual pain will be even worse. You'll cry out, Dad, Dad, my father, my father, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why can't you be with me in this moment when I need you the most? But remember, Jesus, I've not gone anywhere. I am with you always, just as we are with our children always. But you'll die. You'll be buried in a borrowed tomb. Three days later, some women will come to check on the tomb, and they'll find that the stone is not in its proper place. But they'll also discover that you're not in your proper place. Because you will have risen, and you'll be right back here with me in heaven. And we'll be having the biggest Easter party the world has ever known, or will ever know. We'll shout to the world, look, God's dwelling place is now among people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. We will sing Emmanuel. Emmanuel, his name is called Emmanuel. God with us, revealed in us. His name is called Emmanuel. Your name, Jesus, is called Emmanuel, God with us. Can you do that, son? Are you up for that? Are you willing to do that? And in my imaginary conversation, Jesus takes it all in, and he weighs it, and he considers it, and he counts the cost, and he takes a big gulp, and he says, yes, I am. I will look at them, and I will tell them I am with you always, even to the end of the age, because that's who we are. I will be the word become flesh. I will be Emmanuel, God with them, and I will tell them, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've told you. And then I will tell them that my dad, God, is love. That will be our Christmas present to them. We won't leave them. We won't forsake them. Even when they hate us, we'll continue loving them. Even when they turn away, we'll continue to pursue them. I have to go, Dad. We can't not go. We can't just shout out from heaven about our love. We've got to show our love on the earth. I will go. And I will show them how good you are. I will show them how much you love them. I will be Emmanuel, God, with them. Merry Christmas, Dad. And God might reply, Merry Christmas, Emmanuel. And that, my friends, brings us right back to where we started from. 
In Matthew chapter 1, when, when all this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message to the prophet, look, a virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means, let's say it together, God with us. Amen. The song is Emmanuel. Let's stand and sing together. Would you be seated? And join me in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity and made covenant to be our sovereign God. You spoke to us through your prophets who looked for that day when justice would roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nation will not lift up sword against nation and neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise you and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be a light to the nations. You scatter the proud in the imagination of their hearts. You have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You put down the mighty from their thrones and exalt those of low degree. You fill the hungry with good things and the rich you send away empty. Your own son came among us as a servant to be Emmanuel, your presence with us. He humbled himself in obedience to your will and freely accepted death on a cross. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by the water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus was at supper with his disciples, and he took the bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave to them and said, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them. And he said, drink you all of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. 
Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Would those who are going to be helping with communion go ahead and come up? I assume, yeah. And remember, in the United Methodist Church, communion is open to all people. Uh, if, you're, if you're here, you're welcome to receive communion. If you're online with us, you're welcome to receive communion with us uh, because all are invited to the table of God to receive the sacrament. Come and receive. You receive a piece of bread, you receive a cup. Trash cans are on the end of the pews as you, as you leave, so you can leave your cups there.
The announcements for the most part are printed in your bulletin. I'm gonna lift up a couple of them. First of all, uh, one that's not in the bulletin, Christmas Eve readings are now available. We need about 12 people to read on Christmas Eve, so about six in the morning and six in the evening, 10 in the morning and four in the evening or afternoon. And those are back on the table uh, by Madden's there. You'll find the sheet of paper with your reading marked on it and a post-it note. Uh, if you'd write your name on the post-it note and just stick it to the table there, then I know who's going to do each part. And that will help me to, to know what to expect that day uh, and uh, get all the parts, make sure all the parts are taken. So that's back on the table. Just write your name on the post-it note, take your reading with you, leave the post-it note stuck to the table. Book study tonight at 4 o'clock. This is the Bishop's Book Study. Uh, it was on video uh, Tuesday. She did it live Tuesday and uh, they had way more people than they expected to come Tuesday. Uh, had some technical problems because of that, but it was a really good study. So I hope that you'll come and join me for that. If you don't have a book yet and you would like one, uh, they're downstairs by the, the office. Parents' Night Out on Friday. We just haven't announced that very much, but Parents' Night Out is on Friday. Blue Christmas is on Saturday at 4 o'clock. The Live Nativity is on Thursday after that on the 14th of December. Uh, so there's just lots and lots of stuff going on. So make sure that you check your bulletin, get all of those things on your calendar. The mission projects continue. The, Christmas, the Carol Cares tree is here for a few more days, so you can get things down there. The student boxes are back here. Um, rice meal donations for the kids to be able to pack rice meals on the 13th, I think it is, uh, are being accepted. So if you'd like to help them be able to pack rice meals, with Midwest Missions, lots and lots of opportunities for giving in this season. Let's turn to our last hymn, which is number 240, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. of God, we know the world might not share our values, our way of life, yet we have hope in the love of God that transcends all things. With restored identity, go with hope, joy, and assurance as we live the spirit of Advent, watching, waiting, and working for Emmanuel. God with us. Amen. Amen.